I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. The difference between Christianity and every other religion really is tied up in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. As we will talk about today, Christianity is unique in all the world. One, because only Christianity has a founder, a savior, a Messiah who is still alive. Somebody ought to say amen. If they could find Jesus's body in a tomb in Israel today, next week, every church in the world would be empty. I want you to get that. And guess what? They began to look for him immediately. They have been looking to find his body for over 2,000 years. Even at the height of Roman power, the tomb was empty. If what we believe is a farce, I want to submit to you that there would be mountains of evidence to its contrary. That's why it is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. It is all the proof you actually need. We're going to talk today uh, very strong on this issue as we deal with uh, the second part of our series on uh, end time events. Our scripture reading was wonderfully done by our young sister, and we're going to read John 17, 15 through 17 again. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that, that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, Jesus says something profound. He says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Our message this Sabbath is entitled True Revival and Reformation. True Revival and Reformation. Last day events part two. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Once again, Father, I pray that you make me just a nail upon the wall. Lord, an unworthy nail. But I ask, Lord, that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ upon that nail. Let me not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. The church say amen. So in order to hit end time events, one of the places you have to go is to Revelation chapters 2 and 3. If I had time, or if we were doing a Daniel and Revelation seminar, I'd literally go through every single one of these churches, the time periods they cover, and I'll show you that in a minute, but in each of the phases, what that represents and what it means. I'll just kind of give you the spoiler alert that it is the seventh church, the church of Laodicea, that actually applies to today. And it is that church where Jesus prescribes for us what it means to have true revival and reformation. Now, there's a lot we're going to cover in end time events, but before we go too deep into it, one of the most important things to get is that uh, <clears throat> what ultimately matters is that as we go through these signs, as we see uh, persecution rise, as we go through uh, calamities in the world and all of the difficulties that we see in the world, as that is happening, the church is supposed to be transformed. There will be a shaking where the church will be shaken and those who are half-hearted will walk away from the church. But those that will remain and those that join will be purified. That is the true revival. And we we're talking about this at prayer meeting uh, last uh, on Wednesday. And if you're missing prayer meeting, you miss a lot of good stuff. Uh, we've been going through the book Christ Object Lessons. But, but one of the great signs of Christ's return is the character condition of his church. We look for earthquakes because they're a sign. We look for storms. They're a sign. 
We look for wars. They are a sign. But it is the ultimately it is the character of the people of God that will pull the trigger for Jesus to return. Revelation chapter three and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Jesus then gives one of the most pointed verses and we'll go deeper into this later. Most pointed verses in all of scripture in my opinion. He says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and do what? And repent. These are the words of Christ. Verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Then he finishes the whole um, um, uh, section on the seven churches with these verses. Revelation 3, 21 and 22. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. There were seven churches. What's interesting is that you can, you can list them here. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All of these were ancient churches. Interestingly, they all existed in what is now modern-day Turkey. And there are, you can actually go and visit many of the ruins. These pictures here are some of the pictures of the ruins um, uh, from the actual Laodicea. So you can actually go to where Laodicea was, and this map shows you where all of them were. Laodicea was the southernmost of all of the seven churches. It is the last one mentioned. And interestingly, as you study the verses on Laodicea, you find Laodicea was also the only church that there's no mention of, pers- of, of it having been persecuted. It is one of the churches where it was no, there's no mention of it being persecuted, number one. And number two, it is a church um, that sat, uh, 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 that was made up of people who were quite wealthy, as we'll see. So let me show you a little bit about the seven churches so you get why this is a last day events uh, 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 topic and why it fits even this particular weekend. So you can see all of the churches had their time periods. This, this uh, uh, um, author put uh, faces to it and show you uh, the different people who would have been significant as you transitioned historically. So the way most Christians, Adventists or not, they all look at the seven churches as uh, covering different time periods in church history since uh, the, the, the death and, uh, and resurrection of Christ. So each one of them represents a time period. Um, now, Adventists are different. We, for us, Laodicea starts in 1844, at the time when we believe Jesus left the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary and went into the most holy place and began the investigative judgment. As I will show you, Laodicea literally means uh, a people being judged. So this is the time, that last time from 1844 till today, to give you an idea of how little time we have left on earth When judgment was called on the antediluvian world and Noah was called to build an ark, how much time did God give at that time when Noah was called? 120 years. Are we past 120 years since 1844? We are on borrowed time, probationary time. Time is short. So 
Um, you can look at all the different seven churches. Uh, each of them gets a compliment except Laodicea. There's no real compliment. But Laodicea is a message of great hope, as I'm going to show you. Um, and there are some churches that have no complaints. Smyrna is one of them. Some argue Philadelphia is one of them. But you can see that the churches are of different characteristics. And if we had time and we we're going through all of them, I could show you how their weaknesses and strength are applicable to Christians even to today. So here are more of those ruins from Laodicea. Uh, the name has been defined as meaning judging the people or a people adjudged. There was a king and his, he names the city after his wife, Laodice, and the, the name means judging the people or a people adjudged. So as you look at this message, just take it in the context that a judgment is going on in the world and God is now going through the books of heaven. Now, the Laodiceans lived in a very interesting place. Um, as you can see from the map here, here's Laodicea. Here's Hierapolis and Colossus, uh, Colossae, uh, which is the, where the church of the Colossians was from. And Paul actually tells them to make sure to deliver letters to Laodicea Le uh, when they get them. Um, but there were hot springs in Hierapolis, uh, six miles to the north, and cold from Colossus, nine miles to the east. There was an aqueduct, so that, the, so that when you read the thing about Laodicea, it makes sense. There was an aqueduct that brought water to Laodicea that would have, a, uh, that would have sat likely in a tower and been lukewarm. So Laodicea, unlike the other two cities, Hierapolis, people came from all over the Roman Empire to sit in the baths. They had swimming pools. The water, they were, they, you know, they, they had, they, people got hydrotherapy there. Uh, Colossus, they had the, the cool water, they, they grew food, they were at the end of a valley, so they were protected. Laodicea didn't have that. One of the marks of Laodicea, besides the black wool that it made and its banking institutions and wealth, was that it had a kind of water full of minerals that when you drank it, it could be nauseating. In fact, the doctors, there was a great medical school near Laodicea, and often the, the very water was used as an emetic agent when someone was having stomach problems. So now let's look at the, the verses again. Revelation 3, 14 and 15 says this, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who's speaking there? That's Jesus. And so you get a definition of Jesus in each of these churches. He says, I am the amen. Isn't that deep? When do you say amen? When you agree with something that it is true. Jesus says, I am the embodiment of truth in agreement. I am the amen, he says. And then he says, I am the faithful and the true witness. Here's what's deep about Jesus. When the time of judgment comes, he is not only the judge. The Bible says God has given judgment to him. He is not only our defense attorney. He's the witness. Ha, if you're on Jesus' side, when, you, when your name comes up in the judgment, you cannot lose. I've had a lot of my friends, um, enough of them anyway, go to prison that I know that when you get to court, you need somebody helping you. And unfortunately, the, the system with defense attorneys that are government given and eh, really work all that good. You need a, a, somebody on your side. You need someone representing your interests. You need someone who uh, uh, wants to see you win. And, and if you don't have that when you get to court, it doesn't even matter if you don't have evidence. In fact, most of those cases, they say settle the case. You don't even get a chance to prove whether you did it or didn't do it. They just settle the case. But when you get to glory, there will be someone who has not only stood to make a decision about your outcome, he would have also argued in your defense and he would have witnessed that you have been covered in the blood of the lamb. Ah, oh, he's so deep. Jesus isn't just your judge and your defense attorney and your witness. He actually is the one who serves the sentence for you. Amen. He died so that you might live. The Bible says he's the beginning of the creation of God. And that doesn't mean he was created, as some people would say. If you actually look at the Greek, the way it's phrased is, he is the one who began creation. 
Creation came from out of him. He is the one who instigated and began creation. Uh, John uh, 1, chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing was created that was created that was not created by him. 15, I know thy works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would rather, God says, that you are either cold or or hot. Here, in a statement of rebuke, is a message for the last day church. That the challenge with Christianity, so this goes beyond denomination. I want that to be clear. The challenge for the last day Christian church is that it is a church, uh, and I would argue, especially in the wealthier parts of the world, it is a church that has not made up its mind fully about God. It is a church that instead teeters on the fence, lukewarm in its uh, Christianity and its zeal, not fully committed to the ways of God, but not willing to totally go into the world. Let me show you why that's so relevant, right? Hot is a statement that you have both the intellectual and spiritual aspects of truth. You give, uh, uh, you give off heat, energy in the form of witnessing and sharing the gospel. Cold is a statement that you seek heat. Ha! Why is it better to be cold than lukewarm? Because when you're lukewarm, you think you're hot enough. But when you're cold, you shiver. Yet also that you cannot bring shame. And why, is, why would God rather you be cold? Because you also will not bring shame to the name of God because it is obvious that you are not following him. The problem with lukewarm Christians is they say they're Christians, but by their life and their lifestyle, they actually uh, damage the name of God. We see that all over in America, don't we? People claim to be Christians and they're not even nice. They can be a Christian and not be nice. Like at least that's like the bottom basic. I mean, I, I, I met crackheads that's nice. Drug dealers. Gangsters I've met that's kind and cordial to you when you meet them. You're a Christian and you can't be kind. You're already in trouble. If you if you're lukewarm and you think you've got it all right, but you don't actually behave as God would want you to behave, you damage his name. And in these last days, that is one of the biggest challenges that's going to face the church. Watch this. This is what uh, Sister White says. Review and Herald, February 25th, 1902. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work. And in doing this work, they must what? They have to blend. You know what the problem is? Folk are either in revival or in reformation. And they're not bringing the two together. Now, let me make this plain. So revival is that feeling. It's when the spirit hits you and you, and, and you, and you, and you feel a certain way. And there are a lot of folk who get that revival feeling and they, and you know, and they, and they, and they're, they, you know, they're willing to worship and praise and raise their hands. Some even speak in tongues and, and they, they feel the move of the spirit. But if that's all you get, just remember that even the demons can do that. This is how Satan will deceive in the last days, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I hate to admit it, but I, I used to go to reggae concerts and, 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 the, and the Rastas would be singing. And I remember my uncle was he's a reggae singer down in Miami. He was singing and he said, ja, like this in the lightning flash in the sky, right? When he said, ja, and everyone said, whoa, look, oh, ja, just uh, moving out of this place. <laughs> ja wasn't moving. If you're not careful, all kinds of stuff will make you feel like you're having some kind of spiritual experience. But then there are others who have reformation without revival. They've intellectually come to know the truth, but in intellectually knowing the truth, they have not gotten the spiritual acceptance of that same truth. 
Meaning that they intellectually understand present truth and life's day events and prophecy and all this stuff, but they have not been inwardly converted. And then fanaticism, false revival rises up. And you see that as well in church. We're so folk are so focused on the minors that they miss Jesus altogether. But this is a time, one of the warnings in these last days is that there are going to be revivals. True revival and false revival. Now, I'm not going to judge uh, what I'm, I'm going to just put these up so you can see what I mean. We are about to see a time when these great revivals, we just saw it in Asbury. There was another uh, um, a university that had it. Now, this university is a revivalist re- university. So over the years, over the last you know 120 years, they've had multiple of these events happen. And if you've read online about it, um, what happened at this university in Kentucky or college in Kentucky, um, it, it's interesting because there's some who are very adamantly against it, some very much for it. I'll leave that alone except to say this. The purpose of revival isn't simply a, to, to gather people together. The purpose of revival is to transform characters. It is to bring people to repentance. If you have people singing and doing everything, but when they leave, they go back to living the exact same life, that is not a revival. That's a concert. And, and I won't say what happened here. I wasn't there, so I'm not going to judge. I'm only going to say there was a lot of excitement about it. But our world is not in need of more movement and feeling. It is in need of actual conviction and conversion. So, I don't know. I'll leave that one with you. There's a movie, The Jesus Revolution, and people start saying, ah, look, the Jesus movies come out, and we should be uh, all listening to the Jesus movie and, 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 and watching this. Jesus, I haven't seen the movie. But I will say this. Hollywood doesn't do a good job of really presenting Jesus most of the time. Be very careful. And there was some, I saw some stuff online that really, I was like, yeah, that, that, those things don't really make sense. You see, Chris, true Christianity will not be wholesale mass uh, 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 given to the people. Anytime these things happen, you've got to go back and read and look. And there's some stuff in the book about, uh, in the movie about um, when he washes people's feet and some of the things he says and other things like that. But true revival isn't simply a popular movement. True revival changes lives. And so even the show The Chosen, um, which was financed by Mormons, um, the key actor, Jonathan Rumi, is a Catholic um, who actually, when he was playing, he plays the part of Jesus. And I know some folk watch this. I'm just going, I'm going to tell you why you got to be careful in these last days. In fact, Matthew 24, we talked about this before. Um, when Jesus describes end time events, he does not begin by explaining the events. He starts with a warning. He says, be not deceived. The Greek word for deceived is the word planeo. It means to be led astray. Now, I want you to get this. If you're trying to serve God and the devil wants to lead you away, he's going to start where you think it's safe. If the devil shows up like he does at the Grammys, somebody ought to say amen. Um, If he just shows up like he does on on some of this stuff in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork, you're going to run. So I want to submit to you that if you're not going to be deceived, you've got to understand that even the demons believe and tremble. They understand what we believe and they will fool you. And in this case, this guy went and so one of the, one of the uh, um, characters in the movie, um, um, the Jesus Revolution, this movie, he was playing a hippie. I think, I think this is him here. In that movie, he actually went to the guy's grave in Orange County. I think it's still in Orange County, California. I could be wrong with where the grave is. And he laid on the grave and prayed to the dead man that he would be able to do the part in this movie. He's a very strong Catholic, um, and he actually supports this app, Hallow, um, which is a, an app um, that teaches you to pray to Mary uh, and do these meditations and these chants. And he says one of the weirdest things I read was that he was saying that um, there are people now who, when they close their eyes and think about Jesus, they see him. Now. I say all of that, not, I mean, you, you can figure out whether watching it or not is up to you. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't watch it. I actually tried before I heard anything about it. I tried. I fell asleep. I couldn't watch it. Um, but I'll say this. 
This is how Satan will begin to drop things in our heads. One thing in, in, the, in, the, in that show, The Chosen, there is a sage, like a young man, helping Jesus write the Sermon on the Mount. I thought that was very strange. There was a clip of it, like one of the things I saw on YouTube, of him helping him write the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus did not need help. He is the word. So we've got to be careful because there will be false revival. And we have, it has to be that our Christianity is based on sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Very easy if we could just binge watch Netflix and get it all. But it's going to take digging, searching the scriptures, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line. So Jesus says in Revelation 3 and verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, the people that this was literally written to in Laodicea, they would have gotten this letter and read this, and it would have resonated with them because they were used to the lukewarm, uh, uh, emetic nature of the water that they had to deal with all the time. Jesus was actually giving them a a, a condition that they dealt with in the fact that their water supply, this is literally what it was like. It was lukewarm and it was the type of water that would cause you to throw up. And so uh, God saying to Laodicea, he is saying to us that if you are decidedly neither hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out. There is no fence walking in Christianity. You can't kind of be uh, 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 you can't kind of be a Christian. There's no such thing as a half-hearted Christian. Either you really are or you aren't by default. You, you can do that with your sports team. You can kind of root for the Yankees or the Mets or the Sox, but you've got to be all the way with God. Watch this. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary says this. The tepid spiritual condition of the Laodicean church was more dangerous than if the church had been cold. Lukewarm Christianity preserves enough of the form and even of the content of the gospel to dull the perceptive powers of the spirit and renders men oblivious to the earnest effort necessary to the attainment of the high ideal of a victorious life in Christ. The typical Laodicean Christian is content with things uh, as they are as they are and proud of the little progress he has made. It is almost impossible to convince him of his great need and of how far he is from the goal of perfection. There's something about being lukewarm. It makes you think, I've arrived, as you're going to see. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 188. It would be more pleasing to the Lord if lukewarm professors of religion had never named his name. They are a continual weight to those who would be faithful followers of Jesus. They are a stumbling block to unbelievers. And this brings you back to the parable of the wheat and the tear. You see, Satan will literally plant in the church folk who are actually practicing spiritual espionage. That's why so many people, you know, they, you know they've had bad experiences with the church. And they're so angry at the church, they don't realize they were dealing with tear. It wasn't the wheat. And so you, the devil did exactly what he wanted to do. He, a lot, the, the, the tear was strengthened in its place in the church when you left. And the tear was able to drive you out. And so people are mad at the church. I was going to read uh, one of my friends. A good friend of mine, his father's a pastor. And we went to college together. And he, he was railing on the church to me this week. It's a white supremacist um, organization. That, and he just started railing all of this stuff off. I said, I said, brother, you better be careful. Whose job is it to destroy how people see the church? It's Satan's. I said, you better be very careful. Because if you, <laughs> you, you, you're complaining that someone left the church and won't come back, but then you talk, I said, why would they if they talk to you?
1 Peter 4, 17, Laodicea is a church judge. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If it begins with us. Revelation 3, 17, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Jesus then turns to really lay out the sins of Laodicea was very wealthy. It was a very wealthy place. They had banks. They were, in fact, when there was a great earthquake in AD 60 that destroyed um, all of the, the cities I was just mentioning, Laodicea was the one city that when the Roman emperor, emperor, emperor and the empire actually came and said, listen, we'll give you the funds to help rebuild your city after the earthquake. Laodicea was the one city that said, listen, we have enough. We don't need your money. We'll be, rebuild our own city. They were very wealthy. Uh, they sat in a great place for trade. Uh, um, they made wool. They, they, they were, Laodicea was in a good place. And so many of the Christians confused Material prosperity with spiritual prosperity. They thought that because they were blessed and because they had everything they wanted, because they drove Maybox and Bentleys, the old kind, they thought that that meant God loved them and that they were all right with God. Let me tell you something. Satan will give you what you want if it means it will separate you from God. And let me tell you something, one of the most dangerous aspects of modern day end time Christianity is this gospel of prosperity. I want to submit to you that it is a satanic device. And I have heard many a preacher, great preachers, televangelists stand up and say, if you are, if, if the reason you don't have the house you want and the reason you don't have the husband you want and the reason you don't have the car you want or the job you want is because you don't have faith. I've heard them preach and say, if you just name it, you can claim it. I heard one preacher, Adventist brother too, very famous. I won't say who it was, very famous. I heard him one time preaching in Atlanta and he said, if you, if you, if you, um, he said, if you want a house, he said, go to the, and go drive your car and stand in front of the house. He said, and speak to the house and tell the house. You come in front of my house doing that. I'm calling the popo. I'm calling the police. Stand in front of my house claiming my house. If you want a Mercedes, he said, go down to the Mercedes dealership and speak to the Mercedes. That's idolatry. I don't speak to inanimate objects. But I want you to believe, I want you to get this because what this does in the West, especially in wealthy countries, it makes people think that Christianity is a game of ease. It is a game of much. It is a game of more. When in fact, the opposite is true. The Bible says that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Being a Christian isn't the easy way through this life. It's the hard way. And guess what happens when people lose a loved one or they don't get the Mercedes or they never get the house. Then they say, well, my faith isn't good. And after a while, they give up on God because they can't afford. You know, some of these churches that you have to turn in your W-2s. Did you know that? Some of these churches, you have to to turn in your W-2. They see how much you make. Then you got a tithe based on your W-2. That's private information. That should be protected by HIPAA, Right. It's, and so they, they want, they, they need to know you're paying 10% of your money. And if you, the more money you pay in many of these churches you see on TV, the further to the front you get to sit. Are oh, y'all missing this thing? They have ATM machines in the lobby. And so it's all about the money. I mean, in one preacher, his last name is actually Dollar. And they preach this gospel that if you have enough faith, I want to submit to you that is a false revival. It is a demonic uh, statement because the time is coming. The Bible says when those of us who do not have, and we'll talk about this later, who do not have the mark of the beast, we will not be able to buy and sell. And let me tell you something. I've traveled the world. I remember I was in Haiti and I was preaching on a Wednesday night in Ponsonde, way out in the provinces in Haiti. And on a Wednesday night, in a, there was not even a good road to get there. And I was working, doing missionary work. We we're seeing patients during the day, and I was preaching at night. And, and the church had no walls. 
a concrete slab, there was a roof, no walls, and people, there were just simple benches, and people, the place was so packed, and I clearly don't speak French Creole, but I had a great uh, interpreter. There were people all the way into the street on a Wednesday night. And I said, man, shame on us in America. Are you telling me that all of those people don't have faith while they're poor? I saw the same thing when I preached in Cuba, in Havana. People come by the hundreds to hear the gospel. I've seen it when I've been in, in South America. I've seen it when I've been in Africa. I've seen it around the world in poorer countries where when the gospel is being preached, I remember I was in Jamaica and it was a Sunday night service and I was up in Red Hill staying and I had to, we had to go to Spanish town for me to preach. And we were, I was in a little tiny car and the, the rain was driving rain in, in, in Jamaica. It was so much rain. I felt the car was going to float away. And as we're going, I'm telling the driver, it was a good friend of mine, I said, that nobody's going to be at church in this kind of weather. I was living in California at the time. Where if they see a cloud real good, they don't stay, stay home from church, right? And, 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 and I, we were going to church, and I was like, there's no way anybody's going to be at church in this kind of weather condition. As we're going to the church, you see two men on one bicycle. And the dude in the back is holding like a, 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 a newspaper with some plastic on top for both of their heads to be covered. And they're just singing hymns all the way to church, just riding the bike as if there was a sunshiny day. Church was packed on Sunday night. Don't you ever be deceived into thinking that somehow Christianity means you're going to have wealth and increase on this earth by default. The strongest Christians I've ever met are some of the people with the least material wealth. In fact, many come to America, migrate here and start to do well. And often they shift right out of the church. Jesus says, listen, you say you're increased with goods and that you don't need anything. But the truth is, spiritually, you're wretched. You're just as depressed and anxious as the people of the world. You're miserable. You're poor, blind, and naked. Your sins, nakedness is a statement that your sins are on display The condition of the church in many sins is no different than the people of the world. I would dare if you did a poll of how many men are addicted to pornography who claim to be Christians and those who don't, you'd be shocked at the similarities. So Jesus says, I counsel you, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Here's why the message today at Laodicea, the message for you this weekend that the world celebrates Passover, Easter, and Ramadan, all this weekend is being celebrated. This weekend when the whole world is in a spiritual mindset, here is the prescription that Jesus gives to our condition. He says, listen, I counsel you to buy of me gold. In the book of Isaiah, he says, you can buy these things without cost, without price. So look at this. Number one, gold tried in the fire. First Peter 1 and 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the pairing of Jesus Christ. I want to submit to you that some of you are going through difficult and hard times. You're going through trial. You're going through tribulation. You're going through hard uh, uh, situations. I want to submit to you that if you just give it over to Jesus, he will turn your trial into a purifier. The difficulty you're going through, uh, the, the frustrations you're having, if they're submitted to him, the Holy Spirit will take it. And rather than it destroy you, it will refine you. And it, like the surgeon's scalpel, will remove from you the cancer of sin. Bad habits. And of a tendency towards walking away from God. The second one is white raiment. 
the righteousness of Christ. Galatians 3.27, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have done what? You've put on Christ. You remember the story of the prodigal? When he got back, what was one of the first things his father did? He took off his robe and covered his son. Why? He didn't want anyone to see his sinful condition. How dirty the pig pen and the journey had made his son. He covered him. I want to submit to you. We're going to talk about it. The first stage of Christianity is that you are covered. Whatever you did is covered up. Jesus says, listen, you need to get a white raiment. But the third thing is eye salve. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 6, says, the light of the body is the eye. It theref- if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. In Laodicea, there was a temple to the Phrygian god, Menkarao. A famous school of medicine was there, like I said earlier. They had an eye powder that you could secure. And they used to use this to try and treat eye illnesses. When Jesus says you need to get this eye salve, the eye salve allows you to see clearly spiritually. They would have gotten that in Laodicea because it was one of the things people came to to Laodicea for. There, each of us needs to put on eye salve. Let me, let me show you uh, how, how this is explained. The gold here recommended as having been tried in the fire is faith and love. It makes the heart rich for it has been purged until it's pure. And the more it is tested, the more brilliant is its luster. The white raiment is purity of character don't miss that the righteousness of christ imparted to the sinner this is indeed a garment of heavenly texture that can be bought only of christ for a life of willing obedience the eye salve is the wisdom and grace which enables us to discern between the evil and the good and to detect sin under any guise god has given his church eyes which he requires them to anoint with wisdom that they may see clearly But many would put out the eyes of the church if they could, for they would not have their deeds come to the light, lest they should be reproved. You know what's happening in the church now? There is a a coordinated effort for us to roll back the standard. In the name of love, people are saying, oh, out of love, we ought to just accept this stuff. Out of love, we ought to just, we don't want to make people uncomfortable, but let me submit to you that when the woman was caught in the act of adultery and Jesus went to her in love, Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. But then what did he say? Go and sin no more. Spiritual eye salve allows you to see your condition, allows you to realize you're a sinner. If sin is not really an issue, Christ did not need to come and die. He wasted his time. If he could have just simply said, listen, don't worry about it. Sin's not that big of a deal. You can just go against what I teach. There's no reason for him to come and suffer and die the way he did. You see, the more truth you have, the more this message applies to you. If you have not humbled yourself and repented. The message to the church of Laodicea is a message for each one of us. In fact, many of those words, when it says, uh, it talks about the, the gold and the, and, the, and, the, and the robe and the eye salve, is singular because the church as a unit all at once together can't corporately do these things. Each of us as individuals in the church must do it. You can't be saved on what your grandmother did or what your parents did. You've got to be saved in front of Christ on your own. She says the Laodicean message applies to the people of God who profess to believe present truth. The greater part are lukewarm professors having a name but no zeal. God signified that he wanted men at the great great heart of the work to correct the state of things existing there and to stand like faithful sentinels at their post of duty. He has given them light at every point to instruct, encourage, and confirm them as as the case required. But notwithstanding all this, those who should be faithful and true, fervent in Christian zeal of gracious temper, knowing and loving Jesus earnestly are found aiding the enemy to weaken and discourage those whom God is using to up the build work. There are those who work to tear down this end time work. Let me tell you something. If you are Christian in these days, you have got to stay drinking from the fountain of life every single day. 
There is a, the, the, the way that our culture is going, Paul says it best in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That is the world in which we live, where everybody wants to be right, righteous, but nobody really wants to follow what God says. They don't want the Holy Spirit convicting them. They want, everybody's like, well, it's, it's my truth. It's what I feel. This is who I am. Just like Lucifer, I, 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 I. You see, pride was the first sin. Ezekiel 16, 49, when it speaks of the sins of your sister Sodom, the first sin listed is pride. Satan was proud. He said, I want to exalt myself above the throne of the Most High. The reason that the death that, that is celebrated this weekend, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is such a profound spiritual thing is because it is the antithesis to what Satan wanted. Instead of going higher, Christ came low. Instead of uh, exalting himself, Christ was humbled. The very foundation of Christianity is humility. You see, there's no such thing as an arrogant Christian. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. Can you imagine when Satan and his angels saw Jesus on the cross? We were told that Satan was shocked when he saw Jesus in the manger. Can you imagine seeing him on the cross, bloodied, beaten? They triumphed that they had they'd gotten him there. And all they had to do was keep him in the grave and they would have won. But they couldn't. That's why Jesus says in Revelation 3 and verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and do what? I want to submit to you that if you've been through some tough stuff, don't think that God has done this because he doesn't like you. God has a way of humbling us. Many times in my life, God has had to humble me. And it's not pleasant. I remember when my mother died, humbling experience. Her son is a doctor and she died an ignoble death. Painful. Body racked with pain. I remember the first time she called me when she was given the diagnosis and she pleaded with me. I was sitting at my desk at Loma Linda University uh, East Campus Hospital uh, in the urgent care, former emergency room. And she called me and I was talking to her at that desk and I, I can still hear my mother pleading with me, fighting back the tears for me to find someone to help her. I remember calling every major medical institution in the United States, the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic. I called all over the country, talked to our oncologist there, trying to find a way for her to get some help. Humbling experience. Painful experience. But God, I had to pass through that to understand that I don't have a way to fix what's wrong in this world. So many more stories I can tell you of the times I've had to deal with things that have me, mistakes I've made, foolish decisions I made, caused me great problems and pain. In my arrogance, thinking I could handle what the devil was throwing at me. Only months later to look back and live in deep regret. Some some of it's stuff you regret for the rest of your life. But God loves you. And one of the great evidences that he loves you is that he allows trial to come to you. I know it doesn't even make sense. Doesn't sound right. One of the reasons the wicked seem to do so good and the, and the righteous often seem to do so bad is because God is not trying the wicked. He's trying to correct and perfect the righteous. So if you're going through something, understand that it may just be God is talking to you through through the the work of rebuke and chastening, and he's trying to get you to be zealous and repent. Review and Herald, June 4th, 1895 says, Righteousness within is testified to by righteousness without. He who is righteous within is not hard-hearted and unsympathetic, but day by day he grows into the image of Christ, going on from strength to strength. He who is being sanctified by the truth will be self-controlled and will follow in the footsteps of Christ until grace is lost in glory. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is what? It's imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. Did you guys get that? 
there are two phases. I, I, this is a horrible picture, but the best I could do because it's not on the internet. So I have to actually take it out of my, scan it out of my book at home. This is from the book, Preparation for the Final Crisis. Here is Christianity in a nutshell. When Adam and Eve sinned, it marked the line of man's degradation. You see that? When they sinned in the garden, Adam imputed a sinful nature on us. And from that time on, man has just been in decline. I'm reading a really good book now, How Civil Wars Begin. Powerful book. And this author shows you all across the world in recent modern history how all of the civil wars have begun and how America seems next in line for one. And I, I, I would have to say I see what she's saying because the country is so polarized. But I say all of that to tell you that when you watch the world's history, the only thing that's consistent is the nature of man is corrupted. You know, I, I hear people like Bill Maher on HBO. I watch him on YouTube I, just to keep up with what he's talking about. And he talks so bad about religion in general and Christianity specifically, but he talks bad about Judaism, Islam, all of them. And one of the things he's, he, he likes to say is that war and suffering is all just a product of religion and Christianity most of all. But here's what's deep. Well, he had one guest on one time and the guest said to him, if that's the case, how do you explain the wars and tyranny in communist countries? The religion of those nations is literally atheism. Yet Pol Pot, Mao Zedong and others have been some of the most wretched people the world has ever known. In terms of just murdering folk, he had no answer. Let me tell you something. It's not religion that causes the world's problems. It is the nature of man. And man will always find a reason to be different, separate, hate someone else. And that's what she talks about. She talks about the fractionalizing of the world, how everybody breaks down into fractions. And as they break down into fractions, when a new power comes into a country, people, what, what, what the new rulers will often do is speak to the person through ethnicity and, 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 um, and regional ties, language, a lot of what we see in America. And once the country begins to fractionalize like it did in Rwanda, you can have a genocide. That is the condition of man, though. So as you watch the condition of line of man's degradation, before knowing Christ, at the cross, man is justified. This is what we just talked about. The robe of Christ is put on and your sin is covered. You get a title to heaven. You, uh, it is by faith. You just have to believe. There's nothing you can do. It's an instantaneous work. It calls for repentance, confession, forgiveness, peace, reconciliation, and most important, it is a new birth. So our folks say, well, you know, you got to deal with me. I was born this way. But Christianity doesn't say you're saved the way you were born. Christianity says you have to be born again. And then from there, there's a line of Christian growth. This is sanctification, fitness for heaven. One gives you the title to heaven. One gives you the fitness for heaven. It is by faith as well and is a gradual work over the whole life. Sanctification then is the work of a lifetime. The Christian ought to grow in Christian grace, not because there's something good in me, but because I have died and Christ is now alive in me. Here's what she says. Sanctification. What does it mean to be sanctified? It means an unreserved surrender to God, to know and do his will. It means to be heavenly minded, pure, unselfish, without spot or blemish. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 15 through 17, Jesus says this, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from, evil, from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This is why we don't get caught up in sectarian things. We're not caught up even in political parties. We're not of this world. We're not of this world. Our, our citizenship is in heaven. Verse 17, sanct Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Thy word is truth. How are you sanctified? By reading, studying, and knowing the word of God. As you turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. The light of his glory and grace. Manuscript 140 says this, Christ's death on the cross paid the ransom for every human being. All may overcome because Christ has made an atonement for the sins of the whole world. 
To all, he offers the power of redeeming grace, but he forces no one to accept this grace. Man is left to make his own choice. Those who will not receive Christ as their savior and in his power turn from evil are left to themselves. Christ has died for them in vain. By their sinful lives, they crucify the son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Unless they change, they can never wear the crown of life. And this weekend, again, as the world is spiritually minded in many ways, here's the verse, the key verse of Revelation 3, verse 20. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. The ancient artist painted it this way and I, and I'm not a fan of a lot of these arts, but I have to say the one thing you got to notice here is this. There's no doorknob on the door. Jesus knocks on the door and he cannot turn it and push his way in. You've got to get up and open the door and let him in. Then he says to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. One of the stories I love is a story from one of the Roman troops. They were a hundred of them. And they, they had converted to Christianity and they were, I believe at the time in the area of Armenia. And um, while they were there, the edict came down from the, from the Roman emperor that the Roman emperor was now div- divine. And they went around and they held up um, some kind of a symbol of the Roman emperor and they were supposed to bow and worship that symbol, that, that idol of the Roman emperor who was still alive. When they caught them, they were up in the mountains near an ice cold lake. And they went the first time. These were such effective soldiers for the Roman Empire. They didn't really want to mess with them. They came around the first time. Nothing happened. They, you know, some of them wouldn't bow because they were Christian. So they came back around the second time and they said, listen, we love you guys. You just, you just have to bow. You just have to, you know, you're great soldiers. Just bow and, you know, it'll be over with. Forty of the men said they would not bow. What they did was they began to taunt them and tease them. And eventually, at the edge of the sword, they said, listen, strip naked and go into that lake. While they were doing that, they began to make fires on the side. Those who wanted them to bow to the emperor, they started to cook food. They they started to warm up with the fires. And they marched those 40 soldiers into the water. And as they were freezing cold in the water, the cry from the leader came out, will you now bow? Get out. There's warm food here. There's there's blankets. You can sit by the fire. And they began to say in unison, here stands 40 men for Christ. And they began, to, the, the people on the side started to tease and the smell of the food cooking and the, the obvious warmth on the side as their teeth chattered in the frigid waters. Are you ready to give up now? And they said again, here stands 40 men for Christ. This went on as you could see the men were weakening in that ice cold water. Here stands 40 men for Christ. One of the 40 lost his nerve. It was just too cold. And he came shivering out of the water, wrapped in the blanket. He bowed to the idol, sat by the fire and was warmed up. And they looked back at the other 39 and they said, will you come now? And there was quiet. To One of the soldiers was on the side watching as the food was cooked and the heat was being prepared, listening and watching. He'd heard the stories of the life of Jesus, how he'd healed the blind, 
how he made the dumb to speak and the deaf to hear and raise the dead from the ground. Now, Jesus died on the cross and on the third day got up and walked out of the tomb. And that soldier, as he contemplated Jesus and looked at the 39 left in the ice cold water, he took off his clothes, ran into the water, st stayed with the other 40, with the other 39. And as he got to the group, they chanted again one more time, here stands 40 men for Christ. You see, somebody here is that one man who was sitting on the sideline. Somebody here was watching. Oh, those men died that day. There's a church that's still there in remembrance of those soldiers. And I want to challenge you. As we go through this season, as everyone looks at this weekend, I want to remind you that Jesus as he knocked on that one soldier's heart, he's knocking on ours. True revival is more than a feeling. True reformation is more than an intellectual understanding. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. And it is the way, as we're going to study later, that we receive the seal of God. Christ was humbled on earth so that all of us would see that example. And by his stripes, we are healed. And maybe there's somebody, you want to rededicate your life to him, you want to give your life to him, I just want to ask you to stand. And I'm going to pray a special prayer as we come through this weekend where so many, again, are, are, are celebrating religious things. But you want to rededicate your life. You want to give your life. Just stand where you are. We're going to pray a special prayer of you. Maybe you're the one going through trial and difficulty right now and you can't understand why God is allowing these things to happen to you and you just need the Lord. Maybe there's a peace of mind that you're seeking, but I want you to stand. But here stands another group for Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to understand that in these end times, we are called to have the character of Christ, to be without spot or blemish, to be unlike the church of Laodicea, but to accept the offer given them that we would buy of Christ gold tried in the fire, that we would be covered in the robe of his righteousness and that we would be given eye salve so that in these dark days, we might be able to spiritually see. Father God, there's somebody here today who is really suffering. They're going through trial and difficulty. And right now, Lord, I am asking that you visit them. Send them peace. Help them to see, Lord, that you are working things out for their good, perfecting their character. Help them to see you, Lord, and feel your presence so that they would know that there is a God in heaven and that he loves us so dearly that he does not want any of us lost. Help us, Lord, to take the knocking on our hearts by Jesus seriously. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen, amen. and amen. You may be seated.